Welcome back to the Sense of Life podcast. I'm Joe. And I'm Cody. And today we are talking about two Kiyoshi Kurosawa films, a uh, uh, influential J-horror director. Um, the two movies we are watching are, or we watched rather, are Cure and Pulse. Uh, originally, we were going to watch Cure and a 2016 uh, Kiyoshi Kurosawa film called Creepy, but uh, <laughs> the to, when, to, to be pulled on Netflix, basically. Yeah, Tubi took that <laughs> shit off the the same week that I verified that it was on there still. So yeah, and it uh, it, st- it still showed like on Google when they show you where it's streaming, it still showed Tubi. Yeah, when I was looking at it, so it lit- we were just talking about Netflix before getting on here. It was literally like. Are you looking for this? LOL, yeah. JK, it's not here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I guess the initial angle was, you know, Kiyoshi Kurosawa was a pretty pretty big J-horror director. Um, yeah. And looking at something from early in his career versus something later in his career. Um, unfortunately, since we couldn't get the thing from later in his career, we just chose his other more popular film. Uh, yeah. I believe Cure and Pulse are his two, like, the two big ones he's known for. So yeah, Cure Cure was uh, what they call his big international success. It's got a Criterion edition. Mm-hmm. I think that's where we watched it. Yeah, um, it's we talked we talked about Takashi Miike a few times, and specifically Audition, which was another big J horror uh, sensation. And along with things like Juon and Ringu, uh, there was this. Uh, one missed call was another Takashi Miike movie. There was this whole big boom of um, kind of turn of the millennium, uh, changing technology, changing uh, framework of society type of fear being uh, expanded upon in these kind of things. Although I don't know that it auditions too much about technology, although eh, maybe, but that was the general. A consensus I got from the movies, those type of movies. Although I haven't seen the original Ringu, I don't think we've watched. But yeah, we did watch the remake. Yeah, I I have watched the the original uh, Ringu. I thought it was pretty good. Sweet. Um, is it is it better or worse than the remake? Or is uh, it about the same? I'd say it's about the same. Honestly, um, mm. it's not like with the Grudge, where to my recollection, the American release of the Grudge is actually still directed by the Japanese guy. They yeah, just, yeah. He just was given the chance to make, like, a bigger budget Western version, and he took it. Which, you know yeah. what? Respect for that, honestly. <laughs> get, get, get the bag. I mean... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and the uh, the Ring remake was made by a kind of forgotten director now, uh, Gore Verbinski, best known for the Pirates of the Caribbean trilogy, the only movies in that series, by the way. Mm-hmm. Uh, the other two don't exist. So, just want to make that clear. <laughs> yeah. But as far as Cure and Creepy go, um, I like Pulse. Them. Uh, yeah, not Creepy. We didn't watch Creepy. We watched Pulse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I like them. Uh, really quick, uh, before I forget, and we have to throw it in at the end. Yeah. Um, We just got the podcast on Spotify and Apple. I am using Libsyn. Still trying to figure out the uh, how to use it. It looked like last I checked, we were getting a few downloads in Belgium and the United States. So yeah, shout out, shout out to the Belgians. (laughs) Yeah, respect to the Belgians. Thanks. Assuming you're not like bots and this is a psyop and <laughs> yeah, or, or just some guy using a fucking VPN to download fucking podcasts for some yeah. reason, <laughs> just mass download podcasts with pirated movies or something, yeah. or whatever. <laughs> and um, so I think what we'll do from for now is the next few episodes will still be on YouTube as well if you want to continue listening on there but going forward we are going to try to make the move to mostly uh being on the podcast platforms unless we have video content to show on the channel yeah Uh, i'll i'll put a link to the apple and spotify podcast in the actual youtube description so anyone who's watching on youtube uh if you want to you know continue 
<laughs> watching our stuff going forward, uh, make sure to check us out there. Yeah, and uh, for Spotify, should be fairly easy. Uh, you can... Uh, I checked, you should be able to search Sense of Life. That's uh, C-E-N-T-S of Life mm -hmm. uh, on Apple and Spotify. For Spotify, the link should work. For Apple, I think you'll have to... Okay. Uh, you take that link that'll be in the description and paste it into the search bar that'll be showing on the screen here. Yeah. Just hit search and it'll bring you up to the, um, you bring it up to the podcast or you can just search it if you don't want to deal with that. Yeah. But it'll, all of the episodes of what I am referring to as season one are on Apple and Spotify. Uh, so this can be considered the season two premiere Whoa. of sense of life <laughs> <laughs> i i i figured a change of uh, d distribution and ending on a novel was a was it was a good stopping and starting point so it was it was also quite the novel too it was uh yeah, yeah. It took us quite a bit to yes. actually like coordinate <laughs> and get together so i see i say that's a good finale yeah so uh post hoc uh season finale was last week <laughs> and we are uh what is it not like hawk i guess we're okay. talking season two i don't know i don't i don't know how hawk works um but kiyoshi kurosawa he is a i i would say the movies he made well maybe cure pulse i guess was more horror i think it was the more straight genre um J horror type thing. Cure felt more like uh, he talks about Hitchcock being an influence, mm -hmm. and uh, this felt that felt more Hitchcockian, you might say. So, what it what did you think of the two movies? Oh, I I really enjoyed both of them. Um, mm -hmm. I think I, actually I don't think I I know I I liked Cure more uh, Same. than than I liked Pulse, but that's not to say that Pulse was a bad movie. It. Uh, I would say that this was something I had said when I initially watched Pulse, because uh, the reason I was going to watch Creepy and Cure was because I had already seen Pulse, and yeah. I was like, oh, let's, let's check out some other movies of his. But <laughs> throwing in one that I've already seen, um, I would say that I, I still maintain my initial opinion, which is that it's a really good three quarters of a movie. Um, I agree. The, <laughs> the first, like... The first, like, 75% of the film is just great. And then the ending is just like, eh, didn't really stick it. It wasn't awful, but it didn't, yeah. it didn't, uh, it didn't land in a way that was representative of how good the, the preceding three quarters were. Yeah. Um, it also, I... oh, <laughs> go ahead. Oh, uh, I was going to say, I almost felt the same way about Cure. I can see that, yeah. I I think it was just it kind of threw me off. Uh I'm trying to remember exactly what happened cuz it was <laughs> been a couple of days since we watched it. Yeah. But yeah, there was something about that ending that kind of threw me off and then uh pulse seemed to just kind of uh it's a problem with a lot of like straight genre stuff that it kind of devolves into silliness at times. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, th we'll get we'll me, get to I the. Think, <laughs> I think Mike can be accused of similar things in right uh, some of his more popular stuff, but mm -hmm. we, yeah. we'll we'll get into some of the silliness from the end of Pulse when we get to when we get to that movie yeah. uh, later yeah. on in the podcast. But <laughs> uh, yeah, it I I do want to check out some of his other his other stuff though. Um, me too. I wanna I I do still want to watch Creepy uh, if I can find it somewhere. Yeah. Um, I think it, I've seen it on like Prime and stuff. I think it'll show up again at some point. He he also made a movie called Tokyo Sonata, which is a name. It's a film name that I've recognized, like I've I've heard it before, but I've never seen it. It um, it looks like kind of like an Ozu type of thing. Yeah, like Tokyo Story. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how true that is, but yeah, I, I, I get the impression of it. So. <laughs> Or that's what I get from my initial impression of it, I should say. His uh, his first feature length film was called a uh, Kandagawa Pervert Wars. So <laughs> that's something. Hell yeah! <laughs> um, and, that was a Pinku film, right? 
I believe so, yeah. Uh, yeah. And he also, the, the interesting thing about his filmography, is, at least on Wikipedia, is it's broken up into, like, feature films, uh, short films, uh, V cinema, which is, like, the Japanese word for direct to, uh, direct to video. Direct to video, yeah. Uh, That's where Mika got to start, too. Yeah, yeah. He, um... He definitely made quite a few V cinema movies, uh... Almost none of them, or actually none of them, have <laughs> Wikipedia uh, Wikipedia articles. So yeah, I I'd be curious to watch the V Cinema V Cinema movies because it's it's kind of like this Roger Corman aphorism of the the way you get someone uh, to train as a director is you you don't get like someone that wants to make an art movie to make an art movie. You make someone you get someone that wants to be Kubrick or wants to be Antonioni and give them like strip titty killers three and say, yeah. and say you got, you've got 70 minutes. There needs to be 10 minutes of tits. And, uh, <laughs> I need it in a week. Right. And see what they come up with. <laughs> yeah. Um, it seems that a big chunk of his V cinema, uh, films, are with the title "Suit Yourself" or "Shoot Yourself," and then they all have subtitles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is an insane name for a for a series of films. <laughs> like they made like uh, <laughs> they made like six of them. It's it's like battles without honor and humanity, but <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's like. 95, 95, 96, 96, 96. He made four of them in 1996. That's awesome. <laughs> I wonder if they're good. I Oh, oh I hope so. <laughs> um, oh. So, uh, I think we'll start with Cure, because that was that's the older of the two films, and it's also the one we watched first. First, yeah. Um, yeah, it was... It also felt like a higher budget film than Pulse did, yeah. Um, Although I'm not, I'm not sure it was because I, I was trying to do some research on the budget, so I couldn't really find anything. Yeah. Um, but it definitely it feels the more classical high end. Yeah. Um, like this is a movie that a serious movie, <laughs> quote unquote. Yeah. I get as opposed mean. to the it, it's the it's the A picture and not the B picture. Right, uh, Pulse felt like, um, it now, the thing with Pulse is that it, it used some, like, 2001 CGI. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which is fine, because it came out in 2001. Uh, yes, yeah. So. It, it, it looked like a lower-end version of, like, the CGI, like, uh, house burning from Shutter Island. I don't know, I don't know if you remember that movie. I have actually not seen Shutter Island, that's, that's, uh. There's a there's shocking I know. There's a CGI <laughs> house burning in oh, okay. <laughs> Shutter Island. <laughs> it kind of reminded me of that. Yeah, um, Scorsese movie. It's pretty good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, I already know the twist, so that's a bummer. Yeah, I think, I think the movie still works with that. Uh, with knowing that, I, I mean, I saw Saw knowing the twist. I saw The Sixth Sense knowing the twist, and they both still worked for me. So yeah, that's that's fair. I mean, it would be it's almost impossible to watch. Um, the sixth sense, sixth sense now for the first time, without knowing the twist, it's like yeah, it's like the the uh, Darth Vader being Luke's dad kind of thing. Yeah, where it's like yeah. it doesn't matter like that that it was a twist in 1983 or 1980. Yeah. Um. But, whatever. Uh. So yeah, Cure is like a, I guess we'll call it a psychological kind of thriller. Hitchcockian yeah. kind of thriller. Um, yeah. That initially when we were going in, I was like, oh, I know nothing about this. But then as soon as this the plot started to unfold, I was like, you know what? I think I did read the Criterion description of this like a year ago, and it just <laughs> manifested in my mind. And I was like, oh, yes, I did. I did know that. It's basically a, a film about uh, a detective that is played by uh, Koji Yakusho, who is a... Uh, at least I've seen him in like four or five movies now. Um, he's in 
Uh, he's in Takashi Miike's 13 Assassins. He plays the... Uh, I think he's like the head retainer of the the house uh, that the Lord lived in that that movie was set. Um, he had like a weird limp in that movie. He had like one leg that was way shorter than the other. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think he was in another. Um, or no, that was that was that was Harakiri, not Thirteen Assassins. He was he was the main character in Thirteen Assassins as well. So that's two Mike movies that I've seen him in. Um, yeah, yeah. And he's the main character in this. And he's a detective that is trying to figure out these bizarre, like, killings that are happening all over the place, where someone seemingly just murders someone they care about, and then uh, carves an X into their neck, mm -hmm. and uh, they, they remember doing it, but th there's, like, no motive at all, there's, like, no reason behind their actions, and they're kind of just, like catatonic almost right. uh, afterward and it it is revealed throughout the movie that this is the result of this like psychology student <laughs> from from like a university who is just going around implanting hypnotic suggestions in people to kill their loved ones or yeah. just even just people around them i guess because one of the people that he gets to to kill is like a cop that is in that's hanging out in like a little booth with another cop and he just kills him or he makes him he makes yeah. him kill the other cop uh and uh, i'm i'm like 95 percent sure that like something really fucked up happened to this guy the uh the, the one that's going around hypnotizing hypnotizing people he uh like every conversation with him it's like I I want to laugh because he literally just doesn't know what's going on at all ever. Mm -hmm. Like he's just he's like, where am I? Who are you? And then they tell him who who they are, and he's like, oh okay. And then like two minutes will pass and he'll say, who are you? Like it's like an Alzheimer's patient that just casually will will tell you to fucking murder someone and then you do. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, but. Isn't isn't that part of the hypnosis though? I, I feel like he's doing that on purpose. Oh, you you, th I, you I, think I, you think that he's deliberately pretending to not know what the hell's yeah. going on? Yeah, I I did I didn't quite pick up on it until probably about three quarters of the way through the movie. Yeah, but there there was something about his demeanor at some point near the end where it was like it it seemed like he was doing that purposefully. Okay, like that that's part of the like. There's like the water dripping and the click of the lighter and the who, where, why. It, I, I think I think that's the, it's all part of the ritual to get them into the state it, that he it, can get them to do that. You know what? That makes perfect sense because the constant yeah. like repeating of the same questions and getting you to like think about like he keeps asking them who you are, so yeah, who are you, yeah. and they'll they'll say their name and it, there was like certain characters where he'd like no. Like who are you? Like what? Like who are you? And it's <laughs> he like he forms like a weird kind of bond with the main character for a bit, where he's like, "You're the only one that understands me." Yeah, because um, they it it's not really clear, but it seemed like they have a similar. I I think it's it's kind of a um way to kind of aestheticize the i how a cop um questions and interrogates someone right uh it's, it's c kind of like in true detective how mm. um with M uh, matthew mcconaughey's character who i am rust how rust. uh rust like gets information out of them and i i've sat in on a uh court hearing i've talked about this before but uh you not on this podcast just in like vc and shit Right, but there, there was a video of the police interrogating this guy. It was a child molestation case. I don't really want to get into the details, but there, uh, he is interrogating the guy, and the just it's kind of the good cop bad cop thing you see, but it's he just kind of treat he treat a cop will treat you like a friend, and right to to get you to kind of talk about different things to get a confession out of you and it works and you can see it happening because it's it's not like uh 
tell me what tell me like it's not batman it's more like <laughs> where are they <laughs> where's rachel yeah, <laughs> yeah no I've, I've seen those youtube videos where it's like yeah. the the like hours long like deconstruction of a person in a yeah. in an interrogation room uh where you you can get someone to admit to uh the, the most heinous of act by just slowly inching it out of them by pretending to be their friend and like calling them out on little lies to the point where yeah. it's like they have to change their story so many times where you can basically just get to the point where it's like okay you're lying to me uh, what happened <laughs> and there, there's like little things they'll do where like the questions they ask are leading questions basically and yeah. like any answer to them is an admission of guilt essentially <laughs> right so th this is why they tell you to not lawyer talk up. to police and get a lawyer <laughs> <laughs> lawyer up folks don't talk yeah. to the police it's um <laughs> yeah <laughs> but yeah. uh i th i think this like hypnosis thing and i think uh they talk like carl jung shows up at some point there's and, uh, this kind of Freudian some austrian guy thing. named mesmer yeah mesmer where the word mesmerize comes from mm -hmm. um and it's kind of like hokey pokey, like dumb nonsense, but it works for the movie. Yeah. Um, but I uh, really what I was trying to get at with rambling about police procedural there is <laughs> the how this this like anti cop guy, not like opposed to police, just like a complete opposite of what a policeman does. He gets people to do the heinous thing, not confess to the heinous thing. So right. he gets he gets them to confess who they are, and he molds who they are to what he needs them to do, or something like that. It, right. Just kind of an interesting parallel with the with the cop. And there's this there's this point in the movie where the hypnosis guy he's talk he's talking to the cop, and it almost seems like the cop has the same like gift or whatever because it there's this like uh, paranormal kind of thing going on but it's it's not clear whether that's literal or it's more of a metaphor uh because i don't know if he actually has like mind control powers i think it's more mm -hmm. just like suggestion right it's it's weird and i'm i'm not sure if the cop has those powers as well if those are actually powers it there's a lot of like questions up in the air watching the movie i that might have been why i got a little confused near the end <laughs> Right. I, I see what you mean. Like, are you talking about the scene when the main character, after having spoken to the, uh, the, the, the hypnotic suggestion killer guy, who, yeah. who's, the character's name is uh, Mamiya, by the way. Just, I don't know if I right. continue yeah. to use that or just call him the killer. Um, <laughs> but he, like, gets home and there's, like, this kind of background stuff with his wife that was er we seen earlier in the movie where, like, his wife is sick. And she's like, she stays at home all the time, and uh, he wants to take her on like a vacation somewhere. Uh, when he's done with this case of like solving all these murders that are going on, and uh, he gets home and he sees her just hanging from the ceiling, and mm -hmm. and then like he snaps out of it, and she wasn't actually hanging from the ceiling, and she's like, "What are you doing?" Like he's like down on the ground on his knees. So, like, yeah. is that what you meant by, like, the quote-unquote power? Like, he didn't, the, the I'm assuming it, <laughs> that the killer literally didn't implant him to start seeing people, like, hanging themselves and shit. That didn't actually happen. Uh, May, maybe that part, um, there, there's the part where um, he's going to kind of the, I guess it would be like a pre-trial hearing of, like, all of the big like japanese um like heads of state or whatever mm -hmm. um and he's like you're the only one that understands me and it seemed like he i i, f I feel like i remember him saying you're the only one that's like me i don't know I, there was right that whole part just kind of confused me <laughs> i'm not i'm not sure where i got lost there but e either the the psychological stuff is kind of this like psychic power paranormal thing or that's more of a metaphor for um 
hypnotic suggestion and um, psychology and how <laughs> psychology students are evil. And... <laughs> yeah. That's that's the moral of this movie is that yeah. <laughs> psychologists are immoral. <laughs> yeah, psychologists like therapists are uh, Satan. <laughs> Unfathomably based. <laughs> um, so... Yeah, m most of the uh, the movie is kind of just like the main character finds the the killer pretty pretty quickly, or at least he he uh, they find him like wandering around and like uh, he was at the hospital at one point, and then it, it's kind of just this uh, he's he's going to this guy's apartment and he finds out that he's a, a psychology student and. That he was studying that mesmer guy, yeah. and uh, I'm I near the end of the movie. I thought it was the case that because it it says that he he escapes from the police. This uh, the the killer does, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, Takabe, who is the the main detective like tracks him down to this deserted building. Right. And when I was watching it at the time, I thought it was the case that the detective had like somehow aided him in escaping in a, in such a way that he could track him to wherever he wanted him, wherever he was going to go and then kill him. Mm. Um, but that might be wrong. I think he might've just escaped on his own and then he tracked him down and killed him. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, it's it it's uh it's the ending is a bit of a blur to me at that point. But what what uh, what was pretty clear is that the movie has this sort of like, uh, X motif where like. They they show a lot of uh black X's like, uh, carved on the wall or like in people's neck, and at one point yeah. they uh they watch this like super old video of this woman being hypnotized in like the eight like late 1800s or like early early 1900s and yeah uh in the video that he, he sees that they also kind of uh draw an x in the air in that video and um so the the main character kind of tracks down the killer to this abandoned building and just <laughs> fucking unloads his gun into him and he's laying on the ground um and before the main character actually kills him, he he draws an X in the air, and yeah. and then he's killed. Um, and then, like the actual ending of the film is just him sitting at like a diner, and it was a diner that they show him in like earlier in the movie as well. He was like hanging out with his, uh, I don't know if it was his partner or like a, a detective friend. Were were at that same diner restaurant and uh you, you just see like this woman in the background that was like serving him a minute ago just like walk mm -hmm. out with a big fucking knife and it's yeah. like okay so like is he going around killing people now right which was kind of why i thought that the the first killer was not doing it of his own like volition like it wasn't like an uh, uh he was he wasn't pretending to not know what was going on and he was like maliciously having people kill each other like i don't know what change happened to the main character that would suddenly lead him to start <laughs> leaving these suggestions to people to to make them kill people um i don't know if you have any thoughts on that that ending there um so that was the that was the detective put that suggestion into the one like waiter. Yeah. Yeah. See that <laughs> that ending totally confused me. <laughs> yeah. That that's that's what that's that was what I got from it was that he he killed the the first guy, but that guy had drew an X in the air before he died. So like he passed something, or like implanted the the suggestion in the detective uh to start doing that as well like going around and having people just kill 
Yeah, so the wiki here at the end was like suggesting that the latter now wields the same powers as Mamiya. Yeah. So I guess there is kind of this supernatural thing going on. I, right. If if we take this at face value, um, may, maybe it's some kind of like the police have to be as dangerous as the criminals kind of a <laughs> thematic thing. I don't know. It it felt like a very like we're gonna do an artsy, uh, ambiguous ending, but it doesn't actually make a lot of sense. <laughs> I don't know. That that's yeah. bizarre. It might it might merit a rewatch or something. Um, yeah, maybe. Not for the podcast, obviously. Would it would be weird to do an episode on the same movie again? But uh, yeah. Uh, or maybe we like with Tenet, you could like watch it one time going forwards and then one time going <laughs> backwards. Yeah. If you haven't seen Tenet, that joke will not make any sense to you. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen Tenet, but I laughed anyway because that's what you do. <laughs> Yeah, there, uh, Tenet, there's a lot of, like, going forward and backward in time and shit, mm. so. Right. Yeah, um, Cure, it's, it's an interesting movie. I, I, fa- I found the ending a little bit, uh, confusing, and it, di- it didn't really feel like it earned that amb- ambiguity. I, it felt like there needed to be more of a resolution there. But maybe that's just me. Yeah, I think it might maybe. be one of the more artsy, like J horror films from that that like time period that I've watched. Uh, yeah, in that sense, where there's kind of like that, uh, just ambiguity, I guess that. Uh, mm-hmm. That like Kubrick style ambiguity, <laughs> right? That exactly. every that like all A twenty four movies do now, <laughs> right? Even th- even though they don't do them well. <laughs> Although I did watch an A24 movie recently that was really good. Uh, Talk to Me. I don't know if you've seen trailers for this. Super scary. Uh, very mean-spirited horror movie. <laughs> but I saw some yeah. people like take their kids to this thing, and like halfway through it, I was like, I had no idea why anyone took their kids to see this movie. <laughs> this right. is fucking terrifying. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh- so any any final words on on Cure? Um, it's it's got this big like among cinephiles type rec- uh like um it's got a like held in high regard by cinephiles because it's got the Criterion thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I th- I think it's worth a watch. Uh, it might be worth a rewatch for me at some point. But uh, I thought it was slightly overrated. Ooh. I have to say, not not bad. Just a little overrated, right? Yeah, I, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, yeah. I did, I did like it more than than Pulse, but it's not yeah, like my too. favorite, yeah. Uh, yeah. not my favorite horror movie, not my favorite Japanese movie. Yeah, uh, I, I think, I think a more conventional, straightforward thriller would have been more satisfying, in yeah. my opinion. Mm-hmm. But as a piece of filmmaking, it was impressive technically. So yeah, the, I can't. The directing was uh, really nice. I really liked the uh, the cinematography and stuff. It uh, yeah, that's that's kind of why I, I it felt more like a higher budget than than Pulse. It just yeah. Looked, it says it here that look. it was uh, it was on a million either. This is either a million dollars or a million yen. I feel like it's a million dollars because it ninety seven. That seems like about a million dollar ninety seven movie. Mm, okay, but. But that's just an estimate. And for Pulse, all you have is the box office, which is just over 300k. Right. Um, which means it was released direct to video, I think. Hmm. Not 100% sure. But yeah, that's Cure. Do you have any other things to say about Cure? No, no, not really. Um, I would say definitely check it out. Yeah, it's on Criterion Channel, I think is where we watched it. So if you're subscribed <laughs> to that. I, I like how our... Our formula is, it's definitely you should definitely check it out. Like that, every episode that's that's our opinion, and I think it's just because we're, we 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 kind of just like watch movies. <laughs> it's just yeah. like you know, hey, you should watch it. 
Was it amazing? Not really, but you know, if you like watching movies, then you should. Watch it. <laughs> if 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 you're a, a movie guy's movie guy, maybe watch it. It it's um it's it's an interesting movie. It's it's not. I I think movies that you kind of balk at by the end and are a little bit stumped by, I think those are almost more worth watching than the ones that are purely satisfying. Mm-hmm. And they're also the ones that are more worth talking about because you're there's more to talk about. <laughs> yeah. I think. Uh, so yeah, I think with that we should move on to uh Pulse, Pulse which is uh, in Japanese it's actually called Cairo, which is Circuit. Which means circuit. Yeah. So it is a not pulse. Wikipedia calls it a techno horror film. <laughs> yeah. It's definitely definitely cool. an accurate descriptor. Um, yeah. It's very like we had we talked about Ghost in the Shell. It's very cyberpunk type, but like lo fi cyberpunk. Right. It's it's like all of the horror that you would associate with cyberpunk, but or like maybe not horror, but like the thrill and kind of disturbed feeling you get from cyberpunk, but with just technology that was available to everyone in two thousand one. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 kind of impressive the uh, the scares it gets out of like a floppy disk and yeah. a uh, just a computer screen. It's very hostile the Eli Roth movies uh, in that way of like showing videos of people getting killed and shit. Right. It's, um, uh, it's, it's one of those movies that um, honestly, a lot of people have probably only heard of it because of like, there's one particular scene that is, is like there are YouTube videos of it with like a ton of views. And it's like, there's like a, a couple of video essays out there about like, Oh, this is the scariest scene ever or whatever you know um yeah and that's how it was on initially put on my radar when i watched it like a year ago i think right and And it was pretty scary it it, it it is pretty scary (laughs) yeah it was we were watching it and you were laughing and i was like and and then you were like this is you you were explaining that the laughter was just a reaction to feeling discomfort (laughs) yeah i i was like nope don't like that yeah there's a just it's like that classic J horror uh, of the girl with the black hair covering her face and she starts like walking forward, but like she's running like it's a nightmare and she's not <laughs> able to like move. And I'm like, uh, don't like that. That's yeah, the, uh, <laughs> not a big fan of that. <laughs> the, the, I guess the, the, to kind of get with the premise of the movie is yeah. it's, it's like, I guess it's it's the similar kind of ghost to something you would have in something like The Grudge, where it's just like a spirit that is in our world, and it kills not even necessarily out of malice. It's just it's just killing people, mm-hmm. and uh, same kind of aesthetic too, with like the pale white skin uh, that they have going as well, but. Uh, there's like the techno aspect to it where <laughs> there's like a scene in the movie where a, a character is kind of just giving this like exposition dump to another character about like ghosts uh, entering our world because the afterlife was too full or something. And they came through uh, via the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's like okay, that makes sense. And there's like a yeah. scene. It was like this guy at this construction site with like red tape, and like the room that he was initially in is like torn down by this big like excavation thing. And then it just kind of the camera kind of slowly zooms in on like a little Ethernet port, like a Ethernet wall thing on the wall, or like a not an Ethernet, a uh, the cable that that you you would plug into the back of a modem that used to go into the wall with like older. Uh, older modems and uh and stuff and it was like one of those like a telephone line (laughs) it's like so that's that's how the ghosts are like making their way around the internet is uh just because some uh they're going in through your telephone line in the wall (laughs) yeah (laughs) and uh so like the, the the film starts 
with this uh the this group of friends that work at I don't even know what the fuck they work at. It, it, it looked like they worked in like a rooftop greenhouse. <laughs> like that's where they worked. Uh and they're they're waiting for their friend who has like this floppy disk that they need with some stuff on it and then they go to his or one of them uh who is the one of the two main characters of this movie because it's kind of split mm-hmm. into uh like two perspectives that converge near the end um of uh her name is Michi and she uh she goes to his apartment and she's she's talking to him uh and she's asking about this floppy disk he like points her to his computer and like I don't think I've ever seen a movie that makes computer setups look as creepy as this movie does yeah yeah <laughs> like this dude's computer setup is like one of those old school style desks with like a bunch of shelves and shit like up above the monitor and like it like arcs over it and there's like he had like four different screens and it's like the old CRT style computer monitors. And yeah. his desk is just covered in crap. Like just there's just stuff everywhere. And she finds the floppy disk and then she goes into um his room and he's like dead. He's he's been he's like hanged himself in the corner. But he didn't look as though he was like he had just hanged himself like he was he looked like he had been dead for days like his neck was stretched uh like his body was pulling his neck from how long he had been hanging yeah there. and his his skin was really taut like yeah, he was yeah. decaying and so it was like she was speaking to his ghost that was his ghost just looked distracted like his ghost was just kind of like huh like what's going on yeah. <laughs> so uh the the scene that everyone kind of knows this movie for is when another guy that works at this, like, I guess it says that they work at a shop that sells plants is what it says on, on the wiki, which I guess makes sense. Cause there was a lot yeah, of, yeah. like they just were working in a greenhouse and, uh, the, the, one of the other coworkers there, like goes to the guy's apartment, uh, his apartment building. And there's like this, uh, this door with red tape on it. And it's Mm -hmm. like covering the entire frame of the door. And I guess the red tape is, is like a a motif that is used a lot in this kind of like how the X is used a lot in, uh, in, uh, cure. And I, it reminded me of insidious. I just recently watched insidious too. Okay. And there's that red door. (laughs) Yeah. The, uh, the interesting thing is that the, the kanji that are used to make up the, the, original Japanese title of the film in, in the opening credits um, the, the first kanji is like uh, two squares one inside the other and the, the, the squares were red like the, yeah. like the tape on the door um, and so like the, he goes into this door he like takes the tape off and goes inside and then he ends up in like this concrete basement and it's like the scariest looking fucking place you've ever seen in your life <laughs> Yeah, and he like looks at the wall, and there's a couch, and the wall is just covered in like markings. I think it might have. There was a scene later on where you see similar kind of markings on the wall, and my my limited Japanese recognized that it was the word "help" written over and over again. Mm-hmm. And the the ghosts also say that when they're talking on like the phone to people, because people will like pick up the phone at several points in the movie. And then there's just a ghost on the other end that's just saying, help me, over and over again. And uh, yeah. so, like, he sees this writing, and then he, he, he just see like, this silhouetted lady in the background, but her face is very clearly, like, pale white. And he sees her, and this, like, creepy, kind of, like, low kind of music starts playing. <laughs> she just starts slowly walking towards him, but she's walking... With, like, these long strides to her arms. This is what I was talking about, yeah. Yeah, but it, but she's doing it really slowly. And there's, like, one point where she's walking where she's wearing heels. And, like, mm-hmm. I guess she just lands on the heel wrong and kind of, like, twists the ankle a bit. And, like, almost falls, but recovers and then keeps walking. And at this point, you'd be, like, shitting your pants if you saw this. Yeah yeah he like slowly he like falls over and he like climbs over the couch and the camera kind of follows him over the couch 
and in, in like a kind of cool shot where the camera goes down to his level on the ground looking under the couch out to where this lady was walking towards him uh and you don't see her feet anymore so it's like oh she's gone but then the next the next shot is literally her hands creeping over the top of the couch and like her face slowly emerging to look down at him <laughs> and he just screams yeah, <laughs> yeah. terrifying just and they're top tier uh it's not even a jump scare it's just like it's just pure actually scary yeah no there's no there's no boo moment it's just like you're like tense holding your chair <laughs> like you know it's coming you know it's coming and then it comes and you're like fuck why is it here <laughs> yeah, like, get it out of here <laughs> it's awful it's it's scary <laughs> it's a damn yeah. good uh <laughs> it, it was a damn good scene and there are yeah, other scenes yeah. like with the, with the ghosts in it that aren't as effective as that one, but they're still pretty good. Um, and what one thing I noticed, uh, I think it was with this one more than Cure, is um, all, with the editing of this film, it wasn't wasn't so much like frantic editing, but there were there would be like the cuts to different scenes happen sooner than you think they are going to. Yeah, the the cuts like, are a lot sooner, and they're yeah often they're a lot more abrupt. They, they, it, yeah, they they are often something very loud is happening, and then it's just complete silence to the next yeah. cut. It's, yeah, it's very abrupt. There's one, there's one shot in this movie that's uh, similar to another shot in Cure of this uh, the police siren thing of just that in center frame, bottom yeah. to, towards the bottom. You hear the siren, siren, and then a normal scene. The rhythm will cut with like three like blares the siren and then we'll cut there was this was like two and a half and it cuts and you just i it almost feels like uh either in the kind of like godard jump cut way uh it's either like that of this kind of almost malicious cutting of breathless to, uh to meet some kind of standard or it's uh a way to um cinematically ramp uh ramp up the tension right. that you're feeling it's it's hard to tell like it it almost fe at times feels like the the studio or whatever needed it to be a specific length so he just did the godard thing but it at other times it feels deliberate right so i it's it's hard to tell but it, yeah. it was it was it was interesting it it also had some shots that were very similar to ones that you would see in Cure. There's a there's a scene yeah. near the end of Cure where the uh, detective is taking his wife to a like was it like an asylum or something? Like I don't even I think it was like a uh some sort of place for the the mentally unwell or something like that. And he he took her there and um the shot is both of them sitting in like a seat off to the side on like a bus and the the camera's kind of like further up ahead in the bus and you just see them off to the side and then like the emergency exit in the middle and all the other seats on the bus are empty except for the one where they're sitting in and right. there are two shots in this that are uh basically the exact same shot of someone sitting off to the side in a bus like going to a location and i think both times it's the main character going back to that initial guy's apartment yeah because they even kind of redo the same shots of her going up the steps to go to his apartment uh the first time she goes there you see like this shot of this like concrete staircase outside of the building of her going up to his apartment and then mm -hmm. when the male co-worker goes up it does the exact same thing with him on the bus and then him going up the stairs so it uh just yeah it's some like w repeat uh, sequences there so you kind of get like familiar with where you're going with the characters yeah there's uh particularly i noticed with this movie less so than cure it feels like a, a showcase and how to do like hitchcock style suspense lo-fi yeah um with you know with the editing and the camera direction and whatnot um there is another thing now that I'm thinking about it, there is a Hitchcock aphorism that uh, he says to that he never uses an establishing shot to establish. And yeah. as I'm as I'm thinking about it now, I don't 
really remember too many establishing shots in this movie or even in the movie before. I don't think so. Like, yeah. There's just like a cut to like something moving and then a cut to the next scene. And that, that I always find that stuff kind of cool. Roger Avery does that a lot. Uh, yeah. Edgar Wright will well Edgar Wright will do it kind of flashy where he does like the match cut thing where they like looting tunes into the next scene. <laughs> I know exactly yeah. what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. Uh, as you said, um, Hitchcock was a pretty big influence on uh, Kiyoshi Kurosawa. So yeah, he he sense. definitely feels like the. I think they call him the Japanese Hitchcock, and I I can see the see the connection there. Yeah. Um, also, this is totally unrelated to Pulse. I just want to say that it's really funny that the first sentence of the biography section on Kiyoshi Kurosawa's Wikipedia is that he is not, in fact, related to Akira Kurosawa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that actually has nothing to do with his biography. Like, saying, this person is not related to this other person is, like, like not really relevant at all. <laughs> like, I'm That's sure... That's kind of is relevant here. <laughs> I mean, I... I guess because they're both directors, but like er, no well, person, yeah, like, like no person in Japan. By, uh, I I just watched a Kurosawa film last night, and someone's gonna be like, "Oh, Seven Samurai." It's like, no, Cure. <laughs> yeah, you know what? This is. The, the, I was talking to Eli in voice chat the other day. Yeah, uh, yeah. friend of the show, and uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I was trying to tell him about these two movies we watched. And I had specifically said Kiyoshi Kurosawa because he's a film guy. I thought he would know the distinction between Kiyoshi Kurosawa and Akira Kurosawa. And like, for a bit there, he was like, "No, nah, I've never, I've never heard of these movies." And uh, he started talking about like Akira Kurosawa's other movies, and I was like, "No, no, no, this is a different guy." <laughs> like, <laughs> I assume this is only a problem like outside of Japan because I'm pretty sure Kurosawa is not like that. It's it's one of those last names that's, I guess, pretty common. Um, yeah, probably. Like, it's uh, it's not something that would confuse a Japanese person to see two directors that have the same last name. But like, yeah, here it, we're like we're like whoa. It's just, it's it's just funny because they're two Japanese directors that got critical acclaim across the world. Yeah, in very different times. Doing very different movies, totally unrelated to each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, I guess back to Pulse. Uh, the second perspective of the film is so the, the, we get the the initial story from uh, Michi's perspective, uh, with her her coworker and the pants shittingly scary scene in the basement with the other guy. <laughs> um, yeah. But then the other the other perspective of the movie is this. This guy, uh, Kawashima was his name, and he's like, he's like a university student. And the first scene we get of him is he's like trying to install, like some he's he's using a a, a CD in his computer to try and install like a like a program to access the internet because this was like back in the dial up days. And right. He uh, it, it's actually a pretty funny scene, it, honestly, where he's like. He's just kind of like murmuring to himself, like muttering to himself as he's clicking all the stuff on the screen to like install the thing. And he like clicks the button and it doesn't work. And he's like, what the hell? Like what? Like he's like trying to get the thing installed. And like the first thing that happens as soon as he gets the internet is like this fucking website that just asks if you want to see a ghost. And then it shows you like people's webcams. It's not even mm -hmm. webcams really. Cause this is like pre internet, like webcams, I guess. It's literally it's like just like camcorders, or it's, it's literally just like a camera in someone's room, like recording them, and yeah. he immediately gets freaked out and like unplugs his computer and goes to sleep, or he turns off the computer and goes to sleep, and then he wakes up and the computer's like on again and it's showing the same website. He like goes to his university and he he goes straight to the computer like uh like programming course people and he's just like hey uh what's up with this internet thing? <laughs> like I installed, I installed it on my computer and it was like trying to show me ghosts. And then like, there's this lady there who is, I don't know if she was like supposed to be a teacher or just like someone who was also a student there that happened to be a bit more knowledgeable. Cause it looks like she was helping everyone else in the classroom. Um, maybe a TA. Maybe. Yeah. She helps him. Uh, she yeah. tells him like, 
Oh, uh, in order to figure out what this website is, just right click and bookmark it. And if it won't let you, then just press the print screen button and we'll, we'll figure something out later. He's like, okay. And, uh, she, uh, is played by, uh, an actress that I had actually recognized from, uh, the last samurai with Tom Cruise. She plays Taka, who is the the woman that he ends up falling in love with in that movie. So shout out to that, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's, uh, she's in that movie and she's in this one too. Crazy. I know actors. Um, they do movies. They, they do multiple movies. <laughs> 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 and so she, uh, he, he ends up following her instructions and does like the print screen thing or whatever. And, uh, she, he he like shows her the ghosts like in his computer and she, he, he like invites her to his apartment and everything's just like a fucking huge mess. Like he's mm. got like a Coke can mountain on his desk and just garbage everywhere. And uh she she's like using his computer and looking at this stuff and she kinda goes crazy later in the movie, which like, you know what? There's ghosts fucking go crazy you know that <laughs> you're you, i think you would be right to go crazy if you saw a ghost um right yeah and she um oh also uh we see a playstation 2 in the background and that distracted the shit out of me when we were watching the movie i was like oh fuck <laughs> yeah. there's a playstation 2 <laughs> bro he's literally me <laughs> yeah <laughs> his room's a mess and he has a playstation 2 in there it's just like me <laughs> <laughs> and uh uh so th their story is kind of more focused on those two characters as opposed to like the the one with michi where it's like her and like these three or four different co-workers that she ends up talking to throughout it the the one with um uh kawashima is very much focused on him and and uh her name is ha harue and uh I think like the the probably my favorite scene of the movie isn't even the one that's like that really scary one in the basement with the concrete like walls and staircase and the the ghost walking toward the guy. It's the scene when like uh Haruhi has has basically just lost her mind and Kawashima takes her on this train and they just go far away and the train stops and He's like, oh, you stay here and I'm going to go talk to the conductor and see what's going on. And she, as soon as he, like, as soon as he looks away, she just bolts off the train and she's just gone. And she goes back to her apartment. And she also, like this other guy earlier in the movie, the, uh, the first initial guy that hanged himself, uh, yeah. she has like eight computer screens <laughs> and, uh, this might be like the best part of the movie for me is when she's looking at her computer and it's like showing the different ghosts uh, or like the different like camera perspectives of people's rooms. And then suddenly one of the screens is like a camera peeking from a dark room behind her uh, of her like in real time. And it's it's. It doesn't even play like a sting. It doesn't do anything that's like jump scare, but like it my heart sank <laughs> when when it showed her on the screen. I was like, "Oh, go to hell." <laughs> this is <Yeah>. not good. <laughs> and then she like turns around and like slowly makes her way toward the camera and turns the light on in the room. And they never actually show they 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 do their best to not show you whether or not there's actually anything in the room. Like the the way that the camera is kind of angled into the room in such a way, um, and then it'll occasionally switch to the camera's POV shot of her, and and then it does this really cool trick where she like puts her hands out from the from the camera's POV, and it looks like she's about to like hug the camera, uh, but then you see a shot of her arms like cupping nothing. So, like, this camera is just, like, there's nothing there. There's just, like, these ghosts are projecting an image of her in real time onto the internet. Fucking terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, at that point, she's, like, just gone. Uh, the uh, Kawashima, like, shows up to her apartment and doesn't find her there. Uh, but he does find a uh, help written all over the wall which was, I think that I mentioned that earlier, that I, I had noticed that. 
Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you have anything else to add about that particular scene or anything. <laughs> I don't think so. Although I, I did just find out that there was a uh, American remake of Pulse. Had yeah, no yeah. idea. Um, uh, it's written by Re- Wes Craven. Mm. And apparently it's pretty bad. <laughs> Oof. That's unfortunate. And uh, Kurosawa had adapted it into a novel, so he wrote the novelization of the movie himself. So that's kind of cool. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I did see that he had, he had novelized the, his own movie. So I'm curious what kind of additional context and like uh i guess specific thematic elements that you would have to intuit from the film would be more explicit in, in the book right uh and there's another little kind of easter egg i noticed in the movie maybe not an easter egg to an average japanese person but yeah. uh there this um movie takes place in the kanto region mm-hmm. <laughs> and for pokemon fans that's gen 1 just so you know. <laughs> well, Kanto is just like the region where Tokyo is, right? Uh, probably, yeah. But it's it's also the name of the region that the Gen 1 Pokemon games take place in. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Just well, there you fun go. fact. <laughs> fun fact for all you Pokemon fans out there. Yeah. Um, so, like, at, at this point, once once a Harue has has, like, been taken in by these ghosts uh kawashima's story and uh, michi's story kind of collide at this point and this is the part where the movie kind of starts falling apart where yep. <laughs> uh up to this point you're like oh people are disappearing because of like these ghosts and yeah um it's at this exact point when the coolest thing happens and then simultaneously the story gets bad where yeah. <laughs> like the the really awesome scene where she like embraces the camera and is talking about how she's no longer alone anymore because uh I guess isolation in the digital age is a pretty big theme in in uh in this which I guess is a theme in a lot of like techno horror and like cyberpunk stuff as well. Yeah, isolation. And um she uh after after this scene it cuts to like a TV that is just listing out people's names and ages and that they're missing. And it's like just this broadcast that you could envision just going on for hours of just like uh, this person aged, whatever uh, missing since when, you know, whatever. And uh, it, the, the movie actually goes for the angle that the ghosts on the internet are killing so many people that like the world is being drained of all its residents like everyone is dying and disappearing like they're at this point Tokyo is like almost a ghost town <laughs> well yeah, literally a ghost town i guess uh yeah it's like 28 days later kind very of thing very poor choice of words actually pretty good choice of words now that i think <laughs> about it um and like Kawashima is just like walking around on the street and he like goes up to this to this vending machine and he just opens the door and all these drinks fall out. Yeah. And he, he grabs another one and that that's when he runs into Michi and he she's like sleeping in her car. He's like, Oh here, you want a drink? <laughs> he like gives her a drink from the vending machine. And then they kinda like team up because he's looking for his friend. He's looking for Harue. And uh they like end up in this like abandoned big concrete building as you do in horror movies right and they find her in there with like a plastic bag on her head and she like takes it off and they're like oh Harway, it's you and then she just shoots herself in the head with a fucking pistol <laughs> and there's yeah. no blood there was no blood or anything on the ground and so at that point I was like, oh, she's already a ghost. Like th- there was no blood or anything when she shot herself. So, and then like the, it shows the this like black outline, which is another kind of visual thing that I honestly, despite how long we've been talking about this movie, I don't think it's been brought up yet, which is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> that the the ghosts leave behind like this like 
kind of black outline where, where oh the yeah died. yeah yeah uh, I, I i kept i kept trying to remember if that was cure or pulse <laughs> <where that laughs> yeah. <happened. laughs> yeah that was pulse and yeah so like uh haraway is dead you know rip all that yeah and uh they they're like trying to get on a like this little boat and i guess before they try to get on the boat uh they're trying to fill up her car with gas mm -hmm. and kawashima like goes back into the abandoned building where they had just witnessed his friend die and uh he's like filling up a gas can with a convenient like pump that's in the building it was like a drum that had like a pump on the top and uh the gas cap like rolls into a, a dark room and he follows he like he's like oh i gotta go get the gas cap he like walks in and we're watching this it's like dude you're going to be emptying the gas into the car that's just outside you don't need the cap fuck the dark room just leave <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> that, that that part was pretty funny and at that point, he he meets, like, the only ghost in the entire movie that looks pretty bad. Like, the other ones are just, like, kind of a little blurry, but they're very clearly, like, humanoid-shaped. And, like, they're very clearly an actor. But this one right. was, like, a really... There was, like, a really big, like, CG effect or, like... And a lot of blurring on this guy where he was, like... His face was almost, like, a white glow. Yeah, it was, it was like, the, the out-of-focus man on Deconstructing Harry... The Woody Allen movie, which I don't think you've seen, but <laughs> not. No. deconstructing hairy heads will get a giggle at that. <laughs> All those deconstructing hairy heads out there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. Um, yeah, he, he sees this like pretty bad looking CGI ghost guy that just gets really close to the camera and uh, Michi like comes in and takes him and they leave and they uh they get on this little boat and then it kind of jumps to i guess before she actually gets in the boat <laughs> this was the, the 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 bullshit that happened at the end of the movie that was just silly yeah where like <laughs> she's like walking and all of a sudden the movie that has felt like you ever see a sh like camera shake that you know is digital you're like oh that's fake as shit <laughs> like, that that's what happened with this movie where like she's like climbing up to go find the keys to this little boat so they can get out on the water and she looks up and the camera shake is like very clearly digitally added in and there's like this huge it looks like an AC130 gunship like on fire that <laughs> just crashes into a building <laughs> It's like what, yeah. the, what the hell's going on? <laughs> did the like did the ghosts get to the pilot of that AC one thirty like while he was flying? Was there an Ethernet port on the on the plane that got that they got him? I don't know. Yeah, it was, it was there. There's kind of an an interesting thematic point that's trying to make about uh, technology making people more isolated and separate and not going out of their houses to do things. Um, so that's kind of profound, and then its execution is just kind of dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it. Uh, uh, this was a point that I had made when we were watching it, but it's it's Death Stranding deals with very similar kinds of um, themes of isolation and technology, and even like automation. Uh, yeah, taking the human element out of things to the point where there's like some commentary in there about like like people started uh actively seeking out specifically job or uh industries where they didn't automate the human experience out of it because you know dealing with people is is pleasant <laughs> yeah and uh um and then 3 months after he released death stranding the covid-19 bullshit happened so he yeah. uh bit too accurate with that isolation thing there um uh so yeah, the, the the ending of the movie it just kind of falls apart at that point where it's like the world is being and it's, drained. It's, it's barely hanging on at that point anyway. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like what the hell? Like 
they they really were like, okay, what happens now? Uh, a giant like, no milita- like a giant fucking AC one thirty gunship crashes. Why is there an AC one thirty gunship flying over Tokyo? No idea. But it's yeah. there and it crashes and it looks really bad. It's um, it's it's like a solid um premise for a movie. It has that it has some really great scares. It uh, it's really fucking scary at times. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, it, like a lot of horror movies, bad ones, it just kind of loses steam. Maybe the second act should have been the third act, mm-hmm. and there should have been more setup or something early on. I don't know. But once it got out of... Because basically, I think it becomes a different movie by that third act. I think that's kind of the problem. Yeah, it and really it, does. It it's it starts out one missed call or hostile or whatever. And then it becomes 28 days later for some reason. Yeah. And then you're just kind of like, well, why? If you've gone 28 why? days later at the beginning of the third act of your movie, something is wrong. Yeah. Something <laughs> something bad has happened because something, it, something has happened. <laughs> it it has gone from like a a you know pretty standard J horror like premise at the beginning, and then in the end it it just goes all over the place. And you know I I guess it it is better that at least he tried to execute on something that was a bit different from what you would expect from J horror because obviously just sticking to the same trend, uh, and not trying to push the envelope is you know, not good either, but yeah, it's just unfortunate that it didn't really come together. I, I think the moment where Harue kind of grabs the imaginary camera and embraces it and talks about how she's no longer alone, that moment would have been an insane thing to end on if they had also wrapped up Michi's story before that moment or had them come together before that moment. Like having yeah. that be like a, a like a cut to black ending would have been crazy but yeah it kind of falls apart at the end unfortunately it's it's a movie that kind of suffers from not i guess not committing to the bit right and uh trying to do too many things right. uh, it commits to a not, separate bit in the last 30 minutes and it's not a good yeah. bit yeah it's a really really bad bit <laughs> <laughs> Like it starts out with like this is a solid genre thriller with some pretty good scares, and then it's just dumb. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess to to kind of wrap up the ending, um, yeah, she, her, and the guy, uh, Kaw- Kawashima, Kawashima, yeah, they 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 I guess they meet some guys on this boat, like this proper like seafaring vessel, and not like a little dinghy that they were in initially. Yeah, and yeah. um I guess he just dies by the way. Like he's just gone. But yeah, he like, he like they get him they get him on the boat and then he's in like the brig or whatever or like the resting area. I don't know, boats. <laughs> I'm pretty sure the brig is like a fucking prison, is it not? <laughs> or am I just uh, wrong? I've heard it both ways. Um <laughs> when you said that it just made me think of Rusty Hinges and the boys from the brig from fucking SpongeBob. I... <laughs> There it is. That's a SpongeBob reference. Yeah. If I guess this one is still going to get a YouTube upload, so I'm going to put Rusty Hinges and the Boys from the Brig on the screen right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if we made that the 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 like podcast thumbnail thing on Spotify for this episode, it would be like, what the f- what the hell is that? <laughs> what does that have to do with Pulse and Cure? <laughs> why we absolutely have to do it yeah. <laughs> or or we do that um uh that handshake of criterion and Tubi thing that you made that you tweeted oh out. yes because that was that this was yeah. a Tubi a criterion fucking double ta- feature yeah. tag team double feature going on yeah so one one of those two things we'll figure it out um, so um, yeah, they're on the boat, and it seems that Kawashima died, and his silhouette is just on the wall in the in her room on the boat. And Koji Yakusho, that was the main character in Cure, also is like a bit part in this, where he's like the captain of the ship. Yeah. He shows up in the first scene of the movie, but doesn't say anything, and then he shows up at the end of the movie. 
So, yeah. <laughs> the movie just kind of ends there. Um, very weird. Uh, not very good ending. A very solid, like, J-horror film up until they they switch to the the scene where the, the, the two stories converge. Like, it was... That was the part where everything just kind of went to shit. Yeah. Uh, probably our first episode where we're pretty profoundly negative on <laughs> some stuff. Yeah, yeah. It. Uh, I mean, I, I still actually would say that the movie is worth watching because the first, like, three quarters of it are just that good. It's yeah. just... The ending is just overwhelmingly not good at all. That yeah, it, th see this this is the type of movie that like you would want to see remade and done really well, right? Because it's it's got problems and it's <laughs> <laughs> right. And if I I think if you were remaking it now, I mean, it would I, I don't know like. It would be very Black Mirror, whatever that show is that I haven't seen. Mm. <laughs> so I'm going to reference it, it for it. <laughs> yeah, naturally, uh, as you do. But, yeah, I mean, it would... I don't know. Uh, I think I think that's the end of my thoughts of the movie. <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, it's worth the watch for, like, the first, I would say, probably... I don't even know how long the movie was, like two hours like on the dot 119 um, minutes yeah yeah so i would say the too first... long <laughs> oh i would say the first you know first 90 minutes were were pretty good the the last yeah. the last 30 just kind of not good at all <laughs> yeah but yeah that's kiyoshi kurosawa uh a couple decent movies with some shaky endings i would say i wonder yeah. if he has a uh i wonder if this is a like a stephen king thing where it's like everyone talks about stephen king's endings always being a problem <laughs> yeah uh, i wonder if this is um uh what is it what's the word i look for a pattern that kiyoshi kurosawa has of yeah weird endings that don't really work Mm. I, I would imagine of anything like creating a story that the ending is something that you would really struggle like internally with trying to figure out like how is this going to end yeah and so uh and writing short stories and yeah endings are tough yeah so <laughs> i mean sometimes you just like yeah that's all i wanted to say and it's like not really wrapped up and you're mm. like fuck i don't know what to do i guess i'll just put it out <laughs> yeah it's uh it's sad but i mean hey the guy's still making movies now it would have been nice yeah. to get like a more recent movie to see like if if there was much evolution yeah um between 1997 and now but we we went from 1997 to 2001 <laughs> so not very far yeah. uh but hey, you know what? The guy, um, he, I think uh, he's made quite a bit of movies. He's been he's made a couple TV yeah. shows as well. Um Pretty Penance was yeah. Penance was the one we saw that was on Tubi, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Like a mini series or something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I think that will conclude this week's episode. Um remember that we are now on podcasting service on Apple and Spotify. Uh go ahead and follow us there. Leave a I think uh leave a review on Apple and Spotify that helps us get uh get noticed by the algo. Yeah. And... Speaking of technological ghosts, help us appease <laughs> the technological ghost that is the algorithm. Speaking of uh this technological terror that we've constructed <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and there's the star wars reference yeah. freaking <laughs> what the hell was i about to say the fucking the peter griffin ah oh, sweet man-made horrors beyond my comprehension <laughs> yeah <laughs> so uh join into the man-made horrors beyond your comprehension by leaving a review for a sense of life podcast on apple and spotify and we will yes. be back next week uh might have an episode out a little early because I'm going on vacation next weekend. Uh, we're going to be talking about two Ken Russell movies. Mm -hmm. So that'll be fun. Yeah. Thanks for joining. <laughs>